So, you know, I had the, so I'm going to go through the campus master plan. And then at the end, I have um, some current projects that you're going to see coming out of the ground that I thought you all might be interested in seeing. So um, I have some slides at the end for that. And, you know, I arrived at Berkeley in 2019, right at the right time. Um, a team had been hired to update the campus master plan, which will guide development for the next 20 years. So um, how great to be here to be able to set the stage for, you know, what I'm going to help um, execute. So we started off um, with a wide ranging question about what makes the Berkeley campus unique. And it certainly is the buildings and we have a range of them. Um, from the classical core and the historic buildings to some of the mid-century and some of the newer buildings. But it's also so much about the campus landscape. Um, and it is that interaction of these, historically, these very classical buildings on this very rough, hilly landscape um, with this creek that runs through it as this natural feature. And as we asked people what made the campus unique, the importance of the landscape just came through um, you know, so importantly, everybody, everybody mentioned this. And of course, it's not just about the buildings and the landscape, it's also about the people that occupy them, the activities that take place within them, um, the research that happens, and the goal of any, the goal, the goal of any campus master plan is support, is to support all of those activities. It is not just to, um, not just to create a beautiful place in and of itself. So we had a few drivers that went into the master plan. Um, we wanted to support the strategic plan um, from the academic side of the house, as well as the chancellor's housing initiative. Um, so the strategic plan has things about interdisciplinary research, diversity, discovery experiences. The chancellor's housing initiative is, um, is something that identifies the fact that we only house 25% of our student body at this point. That is the lowest of any of the UCs and that we need to very aggressively grow um, the amount of housing that we provide on campus. So um, looking, at, looking at that as a, as, as a driver for the kinds of spaces we were providing. And then we were also updating core planning documents about seismic planning, sustainability, resilience um, into what we were doing. And ultimately, what does this plan do? This plan helps us understand where projects can be cited. So for new construction, it helps us understand what development parcels we have, either because they are parking lots right now or because we're going to tear down a building. Um, it confirms that we have the land area to accommodate our needs. We really built up a program based on the student population we have now, where we think it's going, how much square footage you need for all of that, and then we truthed it on the ground. Can we build this much square footage to serve this population? Um, that was a big part of what we did. It identifies things to think about when we develop projects um, so that we can make informed decisions. It thinks about the physical campus holistically so that different systems um, like transportation, pedestrian pathways, sustainability, all of these things support each other. Most importantly, it is not a funding plan or an, or an academic plan. We do not have the funding sources identified in this. Um, and any of the sites that you see are somewhat agnostic as far as what department goes where. There are some assumptions that you could loosely make based on proximities, but this plan does not go into that level of specificity. And it envisions the future of how the campus will look and feel. So here is one of the final images that came out of the plan. Um, anything you see in dark orange here are sites that we talk about building new. So this means there's, and there's a lot of new building on here because we need to build to, um, to address the needs of our population now and in the future. Anything that's in a lighter orange is a renovation. Um, I think there are other renovations that are out there. Um, we just had some key ones that we were identifying on here. And, I think what you see is that especially in the center of campus with the exception of Moffett Library. Now, can you all see my cursor if I move it right there? Does that work? You see my cursor? Yes. Okay. So with the exception of Moffett Library, there's not a lot that's going on here in the center of campus, right? And so a lot of our plan was also about protecting areas that we weren't going to develop, protecting landscape, protecting those character defining features um, of the campus and really concentrating development um, on the outside edges towards the city. And then you see the Clark Kerr campus over here as well. So there's a long history of master plans on campus. The first one from 1866 done by Frederick Law Olmsted. 
He was the landscape architect for Central Park, among other things. He did campus work all over the United States. Um, this is a very picturesque plan. Um, we have a few little remnants of it, not much. Really, our current plan comes from um, the um, Hearst International Competition in 1898, um, which ultimately was a Beaux-Arts plan. You can see images of it here and on the right um, that has these very classical buildings stepping up around a central green space. And this was helpful for us in going back and understanding kind of where the campus came from, maybe how we've made some moves that haven't, like Evans Hall and Moffat Library that have plopped themselves right down in the middle of this axis, but it really was a piece of information um, that we used to inspire where we were going forward. So ultimately, we organized the master plan around five big ideas. Um, the glade, the creek, discovery and innovation, campus life, and the cohesive campus. And I'll go through each of these, and there's some pretty renderings um, to show what we're thinking of. So the glade, this really goes back to this idea, and I'm gonna go back for just a minute. It really goes back to, this is the glade here in between you know, the center space that you see in the center of campus, um, which is now the central glade, really going back to strengthening that long-term. So zooming in on that, here's the central glade. We have Evans Hall here right now. This is shown as coming down in this plan. It's our biggest seismic challenge right now. And um, we have some ideas for how to build some square footage, but really maintain that landscape in the future. Um, really using areas like the West Oval in front of Valley Life Science, and I'll have a picture to show you here, um, for stormwater detention and really making working landscapes that are both beautiful um, and also do work for us in terms of ecological needs. And then redesigning the entry to campus here, the West Crescent, making it ADA accessible, perhaps putting a parking garage underneath it on the edge of campus. So the biggest thing coming out of this is this idea that we're going to restore this central glade and um, Evans is going to come down. And um, I would anticipate we're getting a lot of pressure around Evans right now because of its seismic status and I would anticipate that it will probably come down in five years. That's what the timing is looking like. We're building buildings right now that will take people out of Evans. So here's the view of Evans right now. Um, and here's the view of what this could be in the future. And again, this is not designed. There are people whose job it is to make pretty pictures based on absolutely nothing but like a lot of hand waving. And that's what this is. Um, but you know, the idea is that you have a landscape that starts up here at the Hearst Mining Circle that can continue out across the top of these buildings that kind of come out from the hillside. And we anticipate a lot of maybe student activity right here. Maybe there's a cafe, student study space, different things. But back under, we can do a huge 300,000 square foot building underground here, tucked back into the hillside for physics and for other engineering and other sciences that connects underground to these buildings around it. So it's really seen as being a workhorse of a building with vibrationally sensitive underground space, but um, really changing this all into a landscape here. Here is a view, you can see Evans here in the background. This is a view of the West Crescent Gateway. Um, on Oxford Street entrance to campus. Here's a view. I have to say everything looks a little, um, <laughs> maybe perhaps not accurate, but here's a view of what we see that looking like in the future. Evans has come down. We have this low building that's been put in its place. We've redesigned the West Crescent so that it actually has an accessible path of travel across it. We have this parking garage underneath it. You can see the driveways coming down here underneath it. And most importantly, we are also pedestrianizing campus beyond this place. So, um, individual cars, private car vehicles would not be able to drive beyond this location. Um, certainly service vehicles would, but we're really trying to eliminate pedestrian and car um, conflicts um, in the rest of campus. 
Big idea number two is the creek. It's elevating Strawberry Creek as a resilient ecological and people connector. And even though so many people I talk to you know, said, oh my God, the creek is a big defining piece of campus. Most of our buildings actually have their backs that turn towards the creek. And um, we thought maybe we want to rethink that and really bring the creek forward in a way of organizing campus, how you, know, how, how you think about campus and also using it as an asset. So um, we talk about, again, more stormwater projects in terms of increasing the ecological, um, the ecological uh, condition of, of the creek. But then we also talk about things like um, you know, the Wheeler Glade, which is over here. And I'm gonna show a picture kind of over in that area in a minute. But if you think about Wheeler, if you walk through, if you walk through Spall Plaza and walk across Sather Gate right here, and Wheeler is off to your right, when L is off to your left, there's a lot of asphalt over here. And it becomes very unclear where people should walk, where cars should drive, et cetera. And really reclaiming this as a landscape, getting rid of the retaining wall that's adjacent to the creek there and um, you know, stepping down a landscape perhaps with amphitheater seating and different things near the creek. We also recognize that we do not have an accessible crossing over the creek um, east of Sather Gate. So we're gonna show a um, accessible crossing across the creek further up to the east. So here is um, West Oval Glade in front of Valley Life Sciences right now. You see the creek very overgrown um, with plants. And this is a vision of what it could be um, used um, as um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a channel in here that diverts water to clean it um, before it goes into the creek. Um, we've thinned out some of, the, um, some of the species, replanting with native species. Um, and really creating a landscape that people can occupy. This is a place where people don't necessarily sit right now um, out in front of Valley Life Science. And then looking towards, um, here's Sather Gate on the left. This is my office in case anybody has ever wondered what this little tiny office is. It's called the Architects and Engineers Office. Little building that most people don't notice, but there's a parking lot right next to it. My back is to Cesar Chavez. That is the one with the um, V-shaped roofs. Um, and the Golden Bear Cafe. So, you know, long-term getting rid of this parking lot um, and rethinking how you experience the creek here. And my little office gets demolished because it's a seismic problem. So longer term, my little office has been demolished, um, really extending kind of a deck out here where people can sit, access to the creek. Um, and you can see over here across the way at Wheeler, um, where there's kind of amphitheater seating coming down to the creek. So really making the, the creek more accessible and daylight um, in locations. Here is um, a bridge that goes across the creek from Faculty Glade. Um, this is where we've identified the need to add um, an ADA compliant crossing. As you can see, this is very steep, which is why it's not ADA compliant. And this is an idea, again, not designed, but just an idea of what could go back um, you see the music buildings here in the background, which is a much more level crossing. That means that it's a bit longer because um, instead of coming from this air, from this level down here and ramping up really steeply, it extends longer um, so that it doesn't have to slope as much. Um, our third big idea um, is about interdisciplinary nodes. And this really comes from the academic side of the house and what they've said they want to create in terms of um, having interdisciplinary research. And so we decided to look at areas where we could do that. We looked at places where we know we're going to redevelop, um, either at Hearst Field Annex site or up at a Piedmont redevelopment site. That's the parking lot in between the law school and the business school. There are four old houses up here on, um, on Piedmont. Or looking at um, the this used to be um, Tolman Hall, but the gateway site, basically looking at sites that we know we'd redevelop and identifying them as um, potential for interdisciplinary nodes. Um, one of those sites is um, this one. It is the Dwinnell parking lot behind Dwinnell Hall. And here's another view of it here. Um, and the idea that that could be the site, so I'll contrast this image with this image, that this could be the site of an inter interdisciplinary node. Um, one thing I'll note is um, that you see the difference in the paving here on Campanile 
way and what we've done and on campus. It becomes very unclear where cars should drive and where pedestrians belong. And um, then also um, asphalt absorbs a lot of heat. So it's not the most sustainable solution, which is why we show the building on this site. It looks nothing like this. Um, because this is just a picture. Um, we'll be breaking ground on that one in about a year. It's uh, just at the early stages of design right now. And it is a new classroom building and it is advising for letters and science is what's going to go into it. Then we talk about big idea number four, reinforcing um, the Southern edge of Campus Park um, as a campus life connector. This is really talking about Bancroft. And you know, one editorial I have, well, you see all the pink here, which is really all the student life stuff. It has to do with Rex Sports, Cesar Chavez, um, the Alumni House, and really wanting to put all of our student services really double down and putting them in this zone, but then also recognizing that there are parts of Bancroft that are really miserable right now um, for walking. For example, if you are west of Speaker Plaza, which is where the swimming pool is, it's pretty miserable to walk by Rex Sports and to walk down by Edwards Stadium. And how can we improve that? Um, we also, you know, note here, and this is something we're moving forward with right now, which is redeveloping the Bancroft um, garage. Um, this is the one with the tennis courts. It's like one story and it has tennis courts on top of it. We are going forward with a five-story parking garage on that site right now. It's an early design. But to show you some ideas of what this could be, here's this miserable part of Bancroft. Here's Rec Sports. It's just not pedestrian friendly. It's kind of foreboding. And then here's an image of what it could be with an addition to Rec Sports. Um, and most importantly, with this pathway that happens here to the east of Edwards Stadium. Um, so we really add, and so part of these stands come down, but we really add, um, some connections through this part of campus, which tends to be very opaque at this point. But you can see that the Art Deco walls here remain. And then looking at Cesar Chavez, and this is one I have varying opinions on. Um, I do love this building and I love the roof shapes and these, it's just a very, it's a, a very cool building, but it's a building that we have a lot of problems with in terms of the amount of space it provides how that's divided up, um, et cetera. So we do think about taking it down and taking down Alumni House. And potentially if we were to do two new buildings of greater density at both of those locations to provide a lot more space for student clubs and activities, really connecting in between those two buildings to Lower Sproul. So, um, you know, this is Eshelman um, over here, and this is MLK right here, really connecting Sprawl Plaza out to the creek, um, which would make your experience walking along this pathway by Cesar Chavez, um, kind of through the trees, it would make it much more daylit and safe, is the idea. And then the last, um, the last image for this one is um, looking at Bancroft and college, and this is Cafe Strata here on the left, and potentially having a different building at the Anthropology Art Practice Building. This is Krober was the name of it previously, um, the College of Environmental Design here in front of us. Um, we talk about going back with something of higher density. I actually quite like this building, um, so we'll see what we end up doing money-wise, but the biggest thing here is to put in a traffic light. Um, so here shows the replacement, but I'm most excited about the traffic light because if you've ever driven from college and tried to make a left onto Bancroft right now, you are just driving through a sea of students. So trying to solve that problem. And then we did have a fifth um, when, I, when I showed you the slide of all of our five big ideas. Our fifth big idea, which I took out the images for, um, is really connecting all of our disparate, um, is how do we connect all of our disparate um, sites to the main part of campus. So this includes housing, because all of our housing is off this main part of campus. It includes the Clark Kerr campus. Um, of course, we are limited at what we can do at Clark Kerr until 2032, when our covenants on that site expire. Um, we have restrictive covenants on that site right now. Um, but thinking more about transportation and um, pedestrian walkways and how we can 
um, connect people who are outside this main campus. Um, the slides for that just weren't, there weren't any great images from that one. Um, I did want to mention that um, we have been awarded um, a merit award from the Society for College and University Planning for this work. So our master plan is on the cover of Learning by Design magazine this month, which is very exciting. And we will be receiving that award um, in July. And then taking a minute to go through current projects. Whoops, and my computer is freaking out and I'm not sure why. Oh, whoops, there we go. Okay, current projects that we have on the boards. So this one you might have seen, it has already broken ground. It's on Oxford Street between University and Berkeley Way West. It is Anchor House. This is a donor developed project, meaning that there is a donor who is building this and gifting this to us. Um, and it is a new dorm for transfer students. Um, this is a donor who um, heard the chancellor speaking about our lack of housing for transfer students specifically and said, I want to solve that for you and create a community for these students. So this is 700 beds um, in apartments. Um, everybody gets a single, rest, a single bedroom um, in a shared apartment. And then the lower levels here have commercial space um, and a big overlook here that looks back towards campus. This should be open in the fall of 20, yeah, I wanna say 24, maybe it's 25. This is the Gateway Building, and this will start construction um, in September. This is on the location of former Tolman Hall. So this is Arch, this is Hearst Avenue right here. This is Arch Street coming into it. This is um, University House, the Chancellor's residence right here. This is Koshland Hall. Um, and this building is for um, a new college, which is um, computer computing data science and society, which is one of the largest growing um, one of the largest growing departments on campus. It's actually made up of various departments of statistics, information, um, elect, uh, electrical computing, and computer engineering. All of those disciplines will be going into this new building. Um, size wise, this building is about the same size as Valley Life Science. It's quite large, and you can see it's a very much a modern aesthetic. Um, we've had lots of discussions about the appropriate aesthetic for new construction on campus. This is one that we felt was away from the main center of the classical core. Although we are very much using colors that are reminiscent of the adjacent buildings. You'll see that the roof up here has a terracotta color on it on the walking surface that matches the terracotta around here. But this building is arranged around two big um, two big courtyards, one here on Hearst Street that really welcomes people into the building. Um, and you walk under the building, kind of like you did with Tolman, although um, the area you walk under is about twice as tall as we had at Tolman. But there's this big outdoor courtyard here on the front. And then you'll see there's another one here on the back. And the one on the back, and I'm showing you this plan, so you can just see how this courtyard on the back connects to this courtyard. There's parking here right now in the Wellman Courtyard, Hillgard, Giannini, Wellman. Um, but, you know, really purposely trying to connect these landscapes to each other. There's some trailers here right now that are going to go away pretty soon. Um, and so we're connecting these landscapes together and we'll eventually have picnic tables and different things. There will be a cafe down here on the left. But here's a view of that rear courtyard and it steps down like an amphitheater. So it steps down into the lowest level. Over here would be the Wellman courtyard. Um, and then there's a cafe and here you can see the outdoor seating for this cafe over here. And then this is an interior view. So if you're at this lowest level down here, you've gone down this, you've gone down this amphitheater and you're at the lowest level of the building, which is where a lot of the classrooms are. This is your view as you look back out and you see this amphitheater stepping down. Um, and it is just a very different building for campus in the way that space is assigned, um, in the way it's anticipated to work. Professors do have individual offices. A lot of the other space is intended to be very flexible. Um, where people can take their laptops and work where they would like to and not necessarily be assigned a cubicle. Then of course, People's Park. Um, we are developing People's Park. And um, if you have noticed, we, are, we have really cleared out the number of people that are currently in the park. I think we're down to five people who are still in the park, the last I heard. Um, 
This I give Chancellor Chris a lot of credit um, in developing um, in developing the idea around how this project would be successful. So it is, you know, we have this housing crisis, and it is a thousand beds of student housing. It is also one hundred beds of housing. 1,000, 100, I'm sorry, 1,000 student beds, 100 apartments for um, formerly homeless folks. Um, and then it is a landscape that um, is still a park and that commemorates the history of People's Park. So what you see here on the left is this is the student housing, the T-shaped building. Um, then here's the landscape that commemorates and it, and it flows underneath this building. This one, this part's elevated here. So the landscape continues underneath. This over here on the left is the transitional housing for formerly homeless folks. And here's an image of what that looks like, that um, transitional housing. Here's some views of what the actual student housing looks like. And we did a lot of workshops on this. And you know what we heard from folks was that it was very important that we had as much of a park left as possible. Um, so that is why the buildings are tall. Although I will tell you that all of the South side is being rezoned for this height. So while this is tall, it's there are gonna be a lot of other buildings coming online that are just this tall on the South side. So here you see the view from the center of this park um, and the student housing. Here's the view from the First Church of Christ Scientist um, kind of facing a landscape on that side. And you can see that it flows underneath here, flows underneath here. Another project, and that will break ground, I'm sorry, that breaks ground um, end of the summer and will be ready for student occupation in the fall of 24. Another project we have going on is an addition to the Bechtel Engineering Center, and this is for College of Engineering. This is for all of their student services. It's very much kind of a student union in some ways for engineering. Um, and Bechtel, if you don't know where it is, is tucked right over here in the engineering quad, kind of next to Evans Hall. So it's largely hidden. And here it is right now. It's kind of a bunker of a building. This is Davis Hall that you see behind it. This is, you know, this is the very low Bechtel that's largely underground, largely hidden. And we know that when Evans comes down, this is going to be a site that has a new face onto this central glade. And so it's going to have a different level of importance that it does right now. And what we talk of what we're doing, this is what we've designed, we're still working on it. This is the future Evans that you see here on the right hand side. This is kind of notational. Here's Hearst Mining right here on the right. Um, we are building three floors um, of a very kind of classically formed building on top of this um, concrete base, but very modern in terms of its materials and aesthetics. So largely a glass and steel building um, on top of this concrete base. And it's a very interesting building for you know, engineering to do in as much as because we're tying on top of an existing building, we're having to be very careful about the kind of loads we're putting on top of it and how we're doing it. So technically it's been a very interesting project from an engineering perspective and we certainly have the right client for that. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is you might've seen a few of these signs go up. Um, we revamped all of our campus signage as part of this, um, as part of this master plan. And one of the things that came out of that was we had heard for a long time from colleges that they wanted to have monument signage that identified um, their individual colleges. So every college can now have one of these signs in a location of their choosing. And we have two that have been deployed, one for College of Natural Resources and another one for the College of Chemistry. And College of Optometry is working on one right now as well. And that is the end of my presentation. And I am happy to take any questions. I see that Heidi has a question. So to answer your question, Heidi, this is Dwight here in the front. This is Bowditch right here. This is First Church of Christ Scientist. Haste is the street back behind this. So in this view, Haste would be back behind this building over here to the right. And Haste would be over here where I'm Bowditch here. This is Haste to the right over here. Haste is behind this building. I hope that helps. Uh, somebody commented that the traffic light at College in Bancroft would only be needed approximately 20 hours a week and not the rest of the time. Is that an issue that you would? You know, it's not. I would actually say it's it's needed more than that. I mean, we have traffic counts at that location, so we have traffic and pedestrian counts. Um, 
And, you know, we're definitely, we have a list of projects that we discuss with the city. Um, and this is on the list. We'll see where it, where, where it comes out. It's definitely one that we would want to partner with the city on paying for. Okay. Um, um, the plan indicates renovation of Hearst Gym, though there is some community discussion that it will be torn down. And I have to say, I, you're probably talking about that, that, um, that, uh, what's the word that I want? You know, there's something that's been put out right now about, you know, sign this petition. We would never think about te tearing down Hearst Gym. So I'm a little stunned, I'm a little stunned that people think we would. Now, there is a real funding question around Hearst Gym. And, um, and I have a lot. To, I have a lot to say about that. Um, you know, we absolutely need money for it. It's not a state-supported building um, because it's not academic. And um, having been around historic preservation for most of my career, I can tell you that raising money for existing buildings is really not easy because people can't put their names on them. Um, and so, you really have to come up with a really compelling use for the building where people really want to pay for a new institute or they want to pay for a new use that happens in something. And, and we're trying to brainstorm around that, but that is a national historic landmark. It's not going anywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is asking if there's anything in the plan or discussion about the buildings below Oxford Street, such as University Hall. Yes, so the master plan, and I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute so that I don't make you dizzy. Um, I'm gonna go back to the very first image I have. University Hall, in the short term, we are going to do a, some seismic work on University Hall um, because we have some surge needs, meaning we need to move some departments around and um, we need to uh, use University Hall in the short term for that. But in the long term, that building comes down. And what we show in the master plan is, and University Hall is right here, um, we show a parking garage at this location. So, um, you know, a lot of our development sites are the surface parking lots that we have, like the one behind Winnell, which is why we need to build parking capacity elsewhere. So we show a parking garage here with a with a building on the front of it. So a very narrow building on the front of it so that there's something that actually faces the street is the long-term plan, but that's at least 10 years out. Okay. Um, somebody just commented that they thought the new signage for the colleges was to hide electrical and plumbing. Um, nope. uh, could you clarify the relationship between the master plan and the long range development plan? <laughs> yes, this is a question I get a lot. So we did them together, which is why they're a little confusing. Um, and they are related, but they're very different. The long range development plan is largely a legal document that, and because we don't go to the city to get a permit for building, we permit our own work under the California Environmental Quality Act. We go to the regions for approval Every campus is required to have a long range development plan, which states how many, how much square footage you think you're going to build in about a 20 year period. And that and then you also have to break out parking and you have to break out how many beds and housing you think you're going to build. And you entitle, like basically the document says, yes, you're good to build this amount, but you have to do a whole environmental impact report associated with it. So we've evaluated all of our environmental impacts from that and we're okay to build this much square footage. There are diagrams in that report that look very much like this because we did have to truth that we had enough that we were going to be able to physically build the amount of square footage we said we needed to build. So the amount of square footage we say we're gonna build is really based on our student population, where we think that's gonna go. It is not the document that authorizes student growth, but we have to assume that the legislature is gonna give us some. So. We, we take those numbers, we put it in, we get how much square footage we need, and we look at development sites. So the other thing that the long range development plan does do is it specifically calls out development sites. Um, this document, the campus master plan is much more of an aesthetic document. So it has the ideas about what the campus is going to look like and um, ideas about the aesthetics. I hope um, that the, another question is about uh, putting solar on buildings. I did see solar panels on a couple of things, but yeah, and that's a standard that we have. Um, 
that's a standard that we have going forward. Certainly our older buildings on campus with the sloped roofs are very challenging um, for putting any kind of solar on, but any new building that we build, that is a standard that we, that we build and install solar arrays. Um, we are actively in conversations about areas where we could do larger solar arrays um, and you know how we can get cleaner energy for campus. We're also actively working right now on a replacement for our campus utility plant. Um, it looks like we're going to be getting some federal money, which would be exciting. And um, that would enable us to build a campus utility plant that allow, allows us to really push towards being carbon neutral. Um, one question, another question is what architectural firms have been hired? Oh boy, um, a whole wide range. So, you know, as a public institution, we, um, you know, we post um, any RFQ and anybody can respond to it. Um, you know, I'm very committed to having architectural excellence um, on campus. Um, and so we have a variety of firms working on campus right now. We have Weissman Freire partnered with Gensler who are doing the new data science building. We have HOK who is doing a new chemistry building up here. We have SOM who is doing the Bechtel edition. We have BNIM out of St. Louis who is doing the Center for Connected Learning at um, Moffitt Library. We have uh, Perkins and Will, who just was hired to do an addition to Haas Gym for basketball training. We have not yet selected the architect for the new um, parking garage here. I feel like I'm missing projects. What um, Letty Madem Stacy is doing the uh, People's Park. They're out of San Francisco doing the People's Park project. They are also doing the renovation of Dwinnell Annex, which is a little building over here near Dwinnell, and that's being renovated. It's a little shingle building. It's being renovated for disabled students programs. And then LMN out of Seattle is the architect for the new classroom building here. Um, EHDD is doing the seismic upgrade of um, University Hall. They recently did the seismic upgrade of Giannini. And then the Anchor House project is being done by an architect named Morris Ajmi out of New York. And I think those are the highlights. Okay. Um, what and why is a covenant at Clark Kirk? Yeah, so the covenants, um, we entered into protective covenants with our neighbors and also with the city in 1982 when we acquired that property. And the covenants run for 50 years and it basically limits the number of students that we can house out there. It also limits our ability to further develop that site. Those covenants expire in 2032. So that is, we're nearing the end. So you see that there's development, you know, as we were talking about housing beds, we looked at Clark Kerr in as much as where we could add density and add dorms, but we actually can't make any moves out there until 2032. Um, uh, com I get the sense that the LRDP thinking regarding transportation predates the more recent IPCC reports about the urgency of getting people out of personal cars as quickly as possible. This is always a tension, always a big tension. Um, we do foresee a future um, with fewer cars and we do, um, we do want to encourage um, alternative means of transportation to the greatest degree possible. We also, have faculty members who at this moment, faculty members and staff who at this moment expect to be able to park as close to campus as possible. And we get a lot of pressure around that. Um, so for example, you may be aware that the Upper Hearst project that we have over here, over um, next to the Goldman School is still under litigation. And part of that is the fact that we're losing parking um, as part of that project. So the parking conversation is fraught um, and, you know, there's current research, there's recommendations, there's also the reality of the pressure that we get, and how do we navigate that? Um, Tom Lolini, um, who's known to a lot of people. I know Tom Lolini. Uh, yeah. Terrific, he commented, terrific work in extending the landscape concepts of earlier plans and finding susceptible sites to develop on the core campus. Who uh, he also was talking about the current uh, architects. 
Um, and um, so that that really was his question. Okay. Oh, um, somebody asked, walking underneath a building bridge or overhanging passageway is rarely rarely as inviting as it is made to look in landscape architectural sketches. I 100% agree with you. Um, so we put a lot of we put a lot of thought into this. So. You know, when you're over, when you have, when you're walking under it at um, at People's Park, it is two stories tall. So it's over at, at that level, it's over 25 feet above you. Um, there is also um, a digital screen underneath that area. Um, we foresee, um, you know, that area being used um, for students to show movies and different things. The height there is very different than I think you've been used to seeing, but I agree with you, it's a challenge. Um, we've also, when we have, you know, you do walk through this gateway building, um, just like you walked through Tolman Hall, and we were very careful to model that condition that existed at Tolman to understand that height, and it was pretty miserable, and what it was like, and to model what we're doing here, um, which is about twice as tall, has a lot of glass on either side of it, um, the kind of lighting that we're putting in. Um, I think the reality is that we need to have a pathway that goes through here. Um, we talked about doing two separate buildings. We ended up doing one connected one, but that experience of what it's like to walk under there, I take your point. You know, I moved here from New Orleans um, where I was working at Tulane. And what's fascinating is that at New Orleans, it was the opposite situation because it was just so rainy and hot and miserable in the summer. Any areas you had where you could walk under buildings were amazing and wonderful. Um, this is quite different. Um Will the Brick Art Gallery building and Anthony Hall both be torn down, the mosaic mural tiles within the brick structure and the Pelican sculpture? No, both of those are shown. Let me orient myself. Both of those are shown to stay. They are, so we have a little light orange right here on the art building, the Little Brick Art Building. So that renovation, if you have $17 million, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> and then the Pelican building here is just shown as remaining. You know, I had, I'm really of the opinion that these smaller buildings that we have on campus, um, I really want to protect them as much as possible um, for a few reasons. They are close to the creek and they're an area, a lot of them are close to the creek and they're in areas that we would not be able to redevelop because we now have regulations that actually prevent us from developing that close to the creek. But when you talk about student um, belonging, um, diversity um, and belonging, so many students, especially from marginalized, marginalized communities, as I've talked to them, you know, they will, men, I've asked, what's your favorite space on campus? It is these smaller buildings that can often give a sense of belonging to different groups when they own a building, it's theirs. Um, you know, I don't know if that's from a history of us assigning these spaces to these groups or, you know, just the idea that, for example, I know that disabled students programs are really excited that they're getting this little Duenel Annex building right here because it's a whole building that they get to themselves that they get to put their name on. Um, it's never a building I would have suggested for disabled students program because it has four levels <laughs> in it. Um, and anyway, it's, 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 it's a lot to navigate and to bring up into AD and compliance, but they are so excited about it because it does let them have something that is entirely their own. And I think having those smaller scale places is really important. Um, the illustrative plan shows two new buildings on the Anna Head site. What will they be? We don't know yet. Um, you know, what you see here is the renovation of um, Channing Hall, which is kind of the big building, right? And then we were showing two new wings um, you know, built as part of that. As you may know, we had a fire at Anna Head about four or five weeks ago, and we're in the process of evaluating the condition um, and evaluating um, evaluating where we are with that. So I don't have any answers about that um, at, this, at this point. Um, are there any long-term plans for gray water systems? There are. So um, another companion plan that um, should be posted on our website soon. I was just looking at the final edits to the document a couple of weeks ago, is our sustainable water plan. It's a resilient water plan, I'm sorry, that looks at um, both stormwater throughout campus as well as water reuse. And so we talk about um, having a water reuse facility where we take black water and, um, and turn it into uh, water, basically take sewer water and turn it into water that can be used for irrigation, flushing toilets, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And if you go through the document when it's posted, I assume we'll post it sometime this week, next week on our Capital Strategies website. It's capitalstrategies.berkeley.edu. Um, you know, we go through all of our non potable water needs, um, looking at how all of this could offset that, et cetera. Um, can you comment on how the California Supreme Court's recent ruling on enrollment affects this plan? It does not affect this plan. Okay. Um, it appears that you're planning to replace the landmark Samuel G. Davis House at 2547 Channing. Is that the case? I don't know which house that is. Uh, Channing. I'm assuming it's one of these housing sites over here, and I don't believe so. Um, you know, really what we're developing is um, Channing Ellsworth parking garage, um, it has tennis courts on it over here. Um, we're redeveloping unit three. Um, I don't believe we're demolishing that house. It's certainly not on my list of what we analyzed. Okay. Um, someone that's also concerned about all the glass facades in this climate privacy era and in terms of fitting in with stucco, concrete, marble existing buildings. Those are big discussions that we, we have though. I mean, those are very important discussions and big ones that we have. Um, you know, I am very lucky to have a um, design review committee um, that is composed of some of the preeminent architects from the Bay Area. So I meet with them monthly and we go through projects and we have these really robust conversations about all of these things. And, um, you know, there is this desire to be climate appropriate, to be um, contextual, um, and yet to be modern. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I hadn't necessarily anticipated, although I'm surprised that I didn't, is, you know, in talking to students about the classical core and what the classical core meant to them, for a lot of students, um, it's seen as being a very colonial presence in terms of the classical architecture and what it represents. Um, and so all of that gets folded into the decisions that we make. And we're certainly much more, I would say, conservative here in this area in the classical core than we are on the edges. Um, uh, I'm curious about the most current thinking on best, most sustainable materials to use in construction of buildings and the best places to source those materials. <laughs> we could do like a whole afternoon on that. Um, you know, the current, um, the war in Ukraine, who knew that so much aluminum came from that area of the world? Um, steel, um, we're seeing pressure on steel and prices and concrete. Um, you know, it, it's, an, it's an involved discussion. I, I would layer on there as well that we do not have the kind of money that I would love to see on the maintenance side. So we really have to build things that are sturdy and will stand the test. We, we, we don't have a lot of maintenance money to do things that require a lot of maintenance. Um, and that includes like painting and different things like that. So we have to balance all of these things. Um, on this new building that's going on the Dwinnell parking lot, um, that is actually going to be a um, cross laminated timber building. So it will be five stories tall. Instead of having a steel structure, it will have a cross laminated timber structure, which is seen as being very sustainable. And we're very excited to be doing a building of this type on campus. Historically, we have not been able to afford to do a building of this type because steel and concrete always price out cheaper. But with the current supply chain issues that we have, this is actually pricing out as the cheapest alternative. So things, you know, we're, we're always bound by budget, especially on state projects. Um, we always have, you know, UC Office of the President has very strong um, sustainability goals. Um, so sustainability is always at the front of our brains. Um, a, a comment, Southside Heights are ridiculously high and unpleasant. So, <laughs> I'm, uh, the neighbors I'm sure think that yeah. also. Um, is there an initiative in the landscape plan to replace eucalyptus trees with native trees? Similarly, is there any tree plan regarding wildfire? Yes, so we have a whole wildfire plan for the Hill Campus. And if you go to our website, there's an environmental impact report for that. That's where you see a lot of the clearing that we do um, and to create areas of refuge, et cetera. When it comes to the main campus, um, we, we, need, we need to have some more real conversations about um, tree canopy replacement. 
and what we what species we see ourselves replacing with. We're certainly not replacing with eucalyptus. Um, it is an invasive that was brought in, although you know, there are certain areas of campus like this whole tree grove down here, you know, that are known for being these tall eucalyptus, but we are losing a lot of them. Um, and, you know, with climate change, as we're getting warmer, we, we are seeing a lot of changes in our tree canopy. So it's a concern. Um, we have an arborist who's going to be coming in um, as a campus employee within the next year or so. Position's been approved um, for this very discussion. Um, somebody else commented, um, I get so tired of the demonization and removal of eucalyptus trees and naked landscape results that last for a very long time. I know, I know the fire danger argument, but still. Um, yeah. It, it, and, it, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's such a defining feature of our landscape and for what it's worth, I love the smell. Yes, I, I think we all do. Um, could you share the consideration given the sustainability of EQ safety for new buildings? I helped move into Tolman Hall in 1962 and I'm concerned that it has been torn down recently. I'm not familiar with what you're with the reference there. Yeah, I'm not either. Um, Phyllis, could you type something more or unmute yourself and ask the question? Good, so that seems a rather short term or life for a building and I'm wondering how much how far out can you predict that the buildings you think are going to be safe now yeah. will be safe well that's a, that's an excellent question so you know certainly even as we look at buildings on campus you know as I look at former Krober now art and art you know and I and we think about tearing it down there's embodied carbon there that I really don't want to send to a landfill right I, I would prefer to renovate something wherever I can um, for so many reasons um, on the sustainability side. I don't think that Tolman or Evans for that matter were ever built with um, kind of the shelf life that they had in mind. In both of those instances, um, it was the seismic deficiencies of the buildings and what it would take to make them seismically sound. You know, at Evans, I mean, it is it is incredibly invasive at Evans to be able to do any, to be able to bring that up to code. Um, and we have done, we've done multiple studies and looked at all of the embodied carbon and looked at what we're putting into the environment. I mean, it's, it's taken very seriously. Um, as we build buildings on campus, I mean, I look for at the historic core, for instance, the classical core. I mean, most of those buildings were built before 1930 and, you know, yes, they need, they need to be renovated, but, you know, they're built of materials that really, that really last. And while I think that Tolman and Evans, for instance, are built of concrete and are built of materials that should last, there are some structural issues in there that were that we were not able to overcome um, in a cost-effective manner. Um, as we build new buildings, we certainly look at life cycle. I mentioned our lack of maintenance, and you know, I mean, I have to assume that we're not going to come back to a building to make major improvements for 50 years. So let's just assume that. Anything I put in, you know, I want to know what it's going to look like five years from now, what it's going to look like 20 years from now, um, and what it's going to look like 50 years from now. Um, so it's an ongoing conversation. At some point, you have to come back in and you have to revise mechanical systems. And, and I, I would add the other thing we talk a lot about is um, flexibility for buildings and knowing, I mean, we come in and do little projects in buildings all the time because the way people teach has changed or, um, you know, we need to update a, a laboratory for somebody. So how do we make those changes as easy as possible, recognizing that our buildings see constant change because the uses change? It's an important part of the conversation. Um, how has the design review committee reacted to the boxy 60s era housing blocks being developed by the donor and at People's Park? Um, well, People's Park, they're certainly design review. I think we're very proud of that project. Um, they've reviewed both of those projects. Um, I think those are projects that are done by excellent architects and we've done a lot. Um, we've talked a lot about that architecture. Um, I think if you talk about some of the developer housing that's going on further afield, there are more opinions about that. Um, but, you know, housing and affordable housing is very, very needed in this market, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, someone wonders if a wind study uh, has, been, uh, has been studied with the covered walkway, tall buildings, et cetera. They have, we are required to do that. So yes, we have wind studies. 
Um, somebody's asking if there would ever be a possibility to have Oski made as a bronze sculpture and placed in Lower Sproul and another viewpoint area by the Campanile to highlight our Cal Falcons with telescopes, possibly a small diorama to display Grinnell. Listen, if anybody wants to come with money and the idea, happy to talk to you. Um, uh, the Samuel G. Davis house at 2547 Channing is on the corner of Bowditch across from Anahad. Yeah, nothing's happening with that um, in Oh, here, here, yes. Um, I apologize to you. All of that is shown as being redeveloped as housing um, in this plan here. Um, okay. We're really trying to pick up housing sites wherever we can. Um, to what extent are you co-planning or coordinating with city development and planning? Um, yeah, so I meet with the planning director monthly um, and we go over projects um, and then we meet quarterly with the planning department staff. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth in terms of understanding what we're both doing. They don't have jurisdiction over what we do, but we certainly want to coordinate. And then, you know, we do have a settlement agreement with the city over the long range development plan where we pay a certain amount of money per year um, over the next 20 years um, for city services. And there's a little bit of discretionary money in there um where there's money earmarked for joint projects that we agree on together so we're just having a meeting next week about what our first joint project should be so they are colleagues that we talk to regularly um, as well as to the elected officials um, in the districts abutting the campus um how are you hoping to fund all of the landscape and creek way improvements oh such a good question it's um you know, it's hard to get money for landscape because people pay for buildings and then you draw a little line about where on where your building goes and you get a little bit of landscape, but then, you know, you have these huge swaths. So part of what we've done as part of the resilient water plan is develop a um, stormwater strategy for campus where instead of, and, and stormwater is a, stormwater is something that every project has to deal with in terms of cleaning, retaining water and cleaning water um, during peak rainfalls. And Traditionally, we've had projects account for that within their kind of little footprint where they build things underground or adjacent to their buildings. And they end up being these very highly engineered solutions that are expensive, kind of built next to the building. What we've developed is a system where we can, we can um, look at the quantity of um, runoff that a particular project needs to address. We can develop a credit system where they pay money into an account for the number of credits they need to produce. And we can pool all of that money to do some larger campus projects. So when you see these projects at the Creek and in the West, um, in the Glade and other places, the idea is that we have created a mechanism where we are pooling money from construction projects around campus and the legal compliance for the stormwater is being taken care of in some of these larger landscape projects where we can really provide more natural systems that frankly don't need as much maintenance. This is the benefit. If we can rely on the creek, if we can improve the quality of the creek and cleaning the water as it goes into it, um, it's actually much easier for our maintenance staff long term than having to deal with these very highly engineered systems that are very um, limited and adjacent to buildings. So that's the idea. We're also looking at grant funding. Um, if anybody else has any other ideas, I'd love to talk to you. Um, somebody else is asking if the Dwinell Annex is the cottage-like design is going to be retained. It is, yes. Um, are there any plans for Albany Village or the Richmond Field Station? So Albany Village, we have a project that should break ground there for graduate student housing in the next three, in the, in the next six months. Um, this is a thousand beds of have apartment housing for graduate students. Um, it is on that land that is right behind the sprouts and, every, and everything right there. It's kind of a fenced off area right now. It's not the, it's not the area of the fields. So that is in design. Um, as far as Richmond Field Station, always many discussions about Richmond Field Station. Um, there have been discussions about Richmond Field Station for 50 years. Um, you know, the issue with Richmond Field Station, it, it, it's such an opportunity. The issue is to get started is, well, there's no there there. So when I talk to anybody about moving out there, they're like, why do I wanna go out there? There's nothing there. And I'm like, well, yeah, you can be the first mover and you can make it place there. Nobody wants to be the first mover. Um, 
And then it's utilities. It is bringing in electrical service, sewer, water, um, and that's expensive. So trying to find a way um, to partner with developers to find a way to get some of that paid for, that's our biggest limitation. Um, I think we're coming to the end. I did have one question, uh, actually. Um, you, you made a couple of references to new parking structures, but um, quite a lot of parking has disappeared. Yes. And is, are there any other plans for parking? Um, yes. So overall in the master plan, we increase, because our population is seen to increase, we increase the amount of parking. Um, and, you know, that runs counter to folks who believe that, you know, we're going to get rid of the car. Um, so we're caught, well, cognitive dissonance there. Um, and so we have, you know, five levels of parking going here at um, Bancroft. We have um, a parking garage going in. If we redevelop unit three, we have a parking garage going in at part of unit three. Um, we have this um, parking garage going here over where University Hall is. We show an underground parking garage at the West Crescent here. We have not addressed um, lower Hearst parking garage, but you know, I think there's a question long-term. I mean, it's not highlighted on this plan. Um, we have a parking garage that goes in over here at Clark Kerr um, in 2032. So yes, we've, we've accounted for an increase in parking spaces. Um, and it's tough to prioritize everything. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Um, thank you, Wendy, for your time today and excellent presentation and um, all the questions that, that people thank you. raised. Um, we thank you all for joining us. We hope you um, are able to join a future luncheon um, and uh, watch the Center Express for announcements and uh, make sure you register for the picnic next in a couple of weeks. So thanks again, Wendy. Thanks for having me and thank you for all the excellent questions. I always love it when people are interested in what we're doing.